what else do we want to tell you about? Liveness, if that interests you, like the interactivity in things, uh, or, uh, yeah, I don't know. There's uh, uh, a... Sorry? Some performance? Performance, uh, somewhere there are documents that describe it. Basically, we're a little bit, we run on, this is running, so there are multiple ways to run this, right? But, but this basically, the, the, the usual way to run it is on the Smalltalk VM, right? In which this is the latest spur, whatever thing that, that the same thing that Pharaoh and Squeak use. Uh, we're probably a tad slower because we have more levels of abstraction. We're not actually, that's, that's a lie. It's not exactly the same thing as they use because RVM has extra, extra byte codes it's used because it turns out that all this lexical scoping and stuff, if you use a small VM, it gets pretty expensive. Uh, it's nice to have a couple of byte codes that handle that and, and improve performance for those things. So it is actually slightly modified in that sense, but it essentially has the same performance characteristics. It's way better than Ruby. It's way worse than, than V8 or any good JavaScript engine today or, or Java or what have you, right? Or Dart. It's way, way worse than Dart. But ultimately, this is a, the, in terms of intrinsically, there's nothing here, I think, that is different than, say, something like Dart. Uh, if, if you threw the same resources, the same top-notch VM engineers in the same time, this can be made pretty damn fast. It can be made not far from Java, probably. But it isn't in reality. Okay? But it's, it's not terribly slow. I mean, it, it's, it's better than Ruby. <laughs> Uh, uh, support. Okay, so um, yeah, so let's find some code that had types in it. But but that but that is what you said is t unfortunately too strong a statement. Uh, okay, so here, right? This stuff in blue between the angle brackets. That's type. That basically everything after the puzzle. Real typical. You can you can erase this. Right, and nothing will happen. It's still perfectly legal, I can accept it. Nothing has changed. There's a bug here in the version I'm showing you, I think, or in the configuration I'm showing you, so it tends to close this thing when it shouldn't. That's another story, but, but that's because I'm using an experimental configuration. But basically, right, I got rid of the type, the thing still works. It's option, you know, we don't care about types. The runtime, no, we, we have no interest in terms of execution semantics. The types don't matter. They're there for documentation. In principle, we could, that means that you can have as many type systems as you want because they're not interfering with, with each other. But in practice, we only have the syntax for, for a thing, and we don't actually have a type checker for it, though it wouldn't be hard to do. Given the few cycles I have to work on this, I have to choose my priorities. Types are nowhere in that priority list. So, so that actually isn't, uh, there isn't. No, there isn't a type checker. It's fairly easy to write one, but we haven't because we, so you can see how much we care. Well, uh, I was interested uh, mm -hmm. uh, in how expressive your, let's say, some example of pluggable type system is. Right, well, so it isn't pluggable. The problem with pluggable is, yeah, what do you expect the interactions to be? I don't know. The core thing is, as long as you leave the runtime semantics alone, you can add different things and you can figure out some syntax or you can put them in comments or you can find some and then display them in whatever you are using the tools, which is an advantage of a tool a system that focuses on, you, on viewing code with tools rather than with a text editor. And they're not going to interact. The only, this system, the annotations we put in, which we haven't checked, whatever, they're largely based on the StrongTalk annotation system. Right? And StrongTalk had a type checker, and it was designed to type check small talk idioms and did reasonably well. You know, there, there are more challenges in Newspeak. There are actually interesting issues around Newspeak type checking because once you have this kind of modularity system, what does it mean to type check when there's no global namespace? Right? Where do the types come from? Uh, you know, that's, there are all kinds of questions like that. And there's, there's also questions, okay, nested classes, first class classes that can be overridden dynamically by, by incoming parameters. How do you type check that, you know, I have, this, I have this subclass of an incoming parameter and I have a method foo and is my foo override type safe with respect to that parameter? I don't know what foo it actually is going to have in the end, right? These are, this is, 
you know, this goes back to, to Cardelli in the 80s when they figured out you can't actually do this. What you can do, you, you might be able to do it now with some super fancy dependent type thing. Or you could do some heuristic that is probably much simpler and, and fine most of the time, which is probably what I'd do if I got around to doing it. And we didn't have this problem in strong talk because there it's more like a conventional language and you have a class, you know what class you have, right? So there's interesting things around typing, but, you know, it's not a... Yeah, but, yeah. I was extremely curious when I just read that the new newspeak has a support for plug and type. So, uh, I, sus so I don't think, if, if you read what I wrote, you will find that it says that there are goals, there are elements that are planned, and is explicitly in the spec says what's supported and what not. People will then, um, yeah, it's probably someone misinterpreted a little, and, and you know, someone ascribes to us better properties than we have. Who are we to tell them no? I mean, why break their hearts? Uh, but no, there's no real type change. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I noticed when you were doing the deploy, yeah. there was a lot of targets there. Is there an intermediate level of format you're parsing to, some AST that is easy to go to, Dart, to JavaScript? Uh, how we're basically uh, what, right? We have compi compilers for these different things, right? But uh, so, so the compiler has the, you know, you basically have to figure out what it is you need to deploy, which I think is shared code, and you can reflectively once you have this object, you can traverse it and figure out all all those pieces, and then you have to compile it into some whatever your target format is. So you can spit out JavaScript, or we have. Uh, Victory Fuel is a serialization format that is basically, so there's a serializer for Smalltalk called Fuel. So we, we have this 1984 theme, so we're doing Victory Fuel. And uh, it's just a binary format that's actually a pretty good serialization format. And there are a few others, there's Dart, so again, you know, on any given day of the week, will I bet that all of them work? No, because if someone has, if, you know, if, yeah. And, and uh, you know, when we released the system the first time after we had had funding at Cadence and we finished it, well, fi we were ready to release it, it was actually in more solid shape than it is today because since then we fiddled and made some things cooler, but we don't have the resources to do the same quality control, honestly, uh, much to my regret. But uh, no, the, the, each of these serializers going basically, here are my objects, I have a compiler into this thing or another, and so I... you're not going to an interim... No, there's no inter... There, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Is, so you're not doing any kind of rewriting of, uh, of some, someone does something here, you're not doing any rewriting for performance or anything like that? Well, or whatever the, the compiler, say the JavaScript compiler is designed to, to do, you know, decent JavaScript. Obviously, it's not like we have the resources like Dart to JS to really, you know, knock it out of the park. But, but the, it's whatever the compiler does. Or if the binary format, the binary formats actually use the same bytecodes that this is running. So Victory Fuel gives you a serialization format that includes part of the things that are serialized are the bytecodes for the methods. And when you deserialize it, you get it in an environment like this. And in, so no, no, nothing fancy is happening there beyond that. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, how does errors? Errors? What, us make errors? How? What do you mean, errors? Uh, no, what, what kind of errors are you talking about? Because you said that the classes are dynamically... Oh, oh, that. Well, it's, okay, so in a dynamic language, the only, you know, you can get divide by zero, I suppose, but, but generally speaking, the only error you can get in, in, in a language like this is uh, does not understand, which is, if you want, no such method, method missing, whatever you're used to, right? The method was not found dynamically when you looked it up. At which point the semantics say we, we actually call the does not understand method on this object, which it will have because object has one. So either it has overridden it for its own purposes, or at least there's one in object. The one in object raises an exception to the top level and says, oh my god, you know, you're, what do you do? It basically opens a debugger. In, in this environment, in a runtime, if you get rid of the, the environment, then it'll just say, boom, you know, whatever. Uh, you can't have seg faults, right? You can't have any of that kind of thing. It's a, it's a memory safe, pointer safe language. All you can do is call a method that wasn't there and it'll complain. Or you can trap it, with, which lets you do all kinds of cool stuff. Do you have exceptions? Uh, so, so exceptions in this framework are essentially, 
yes and no, right? The language doesn't do anything special really with exceptions, but it's, a, it's essentially a library construct. So we have resumable exceptions, in fact. So when you, you basically, an exception is you told some, some live class, some, some uh, class object in the library, like error or exception or whatever, you sent it the message signal. And then it went off and reflectively climbs the stack and decides what it's going to do. It basically will look up handlers, which are closures that have been posted at different points on the stack that are, you know, have been sent to, again, to a type so that it knows that it's supposed to use these closures as handlers and it finds a handler. And it starts executing the handler and decides if it actually wants to get rid of the stack or if it wants to go back there and do something interesting, which is why you can write the debugger for this thing in itself. Uh, so, yes, we have exceptions, but not in the, we have it in the small talk tradition, not in the conventional sense. Can you show us the debugger? The what? In this image, the debugger? Uh, sure, I'm, I'm surprised we haven't seen it yet. I mean, usually in demos, you're likely to get the debugger unintentionally, right? <laughs> uh, but uh, sure, so let's, let's, yeah, so let's do something, some live stuff. So I forget what this is. This is a demo I did before, if I only can remember. So, so this is kind of, how many people have seen the Brett Victor thing, the, the famous talk? Okay, so this is kind of, we can try and recreate that. Um, so we can even get rid of this for a minute just for the hell of it. Uh, oh, there we are. Interesting. That was an unintentional debug, right? So, so the debugger is here. I don't know what it wanted, but we might also, so we can, before we get back to that and do the orderly thing, uh, we can show you a bit about the debugger, right? So it shows you the stack, right? It shows you all of the stack and you can open the stack locally, right? So you can see that this called that and you can look at these frames next to each other, right? So every one of these guys, let me close this, so like something like this, it's a stack frame, right? So this is the method with its code, whatever it was doing, and here are the bindings. So the receiver happened to be uh, essentially uh, this, this symbol, and the index was zero, and God knows what uh, happened here. But if I wanted to know who called it and why, well, at called it. At's a primitive method. That's a bad example. It got called from this thing. And we can actually look, we can view these simultaneously, which is a dead obvious thing that very few debuggers do. The, the, Usually the tools let you see one frame at a time, and if you go to the stack and click another, that view changes and all you can see is the next frame, and you don't have them in context. Whereas a stack, I mean, how do you draw, draw a, t a stack on the board, right? It's a stack. You draw all of, you, you can see it. So why people choose to display a stack not as a stack is beyond me. Uh, this, you know, the self-debugger was the first actually to do this properly. We did this in the strong talk debugger, which was never finished. We do it here. It's one of my pet peeves. The debugger should show you the stack, and you should be able to actually view the stack simultaneously. So just while we're at it. Now, what the hell happened here? I don't know, and I don't feel like debugging live. So we'll just forget about it. We'll, uh, okay, I can't see anything, but I believe this is delete. So we delete the method. And we'll start with, let's suppose we wanted to do, you know, a binary search routine. We're going to search for something. So let's say we're going to search for F in something else. Let's suppose we're going to have a list like A, B, uh, C, I don't know. Okay, so it's not going to be there, but anyway, right? So I can evaluate this, but we don't have, right? I'm, this is a workspace. This is kind of a tool for me. It's basically literally an inspector on a, a specialized inspector on an object. And so I'm going to evaluate this. And you guess what? It doesn't have a binary search method because I just erased it, right? But if I click on this link, I get in the debugger, and here's does not understand, which, which is the method, that, the standard trap that, that raised the signal that brought me to the debugger. Because here I said, you know, uh, here, do it. All these here. Here's my original code. It went through some plumbing and eventually ended here. And here I have this method which says create, miss you know, I have options like Okay, this method wasn't there. Would you like to have it? So, click on it. And I hate this. I don't know what's broken. Oh, I know. I'm in this experimental mode. Okay, let's get rid of I know how to fix this. Uh, experiments and demos are combining them is a, is a bad idea. Uh, under the hood. So, 
So that's why it's experimental, because it doesn't really work properly. Uh, okay, let's see that. So now, let's go back to workspaces. Let's refresh this guy, because I don't trust it otherwise. Let's evaluate that. Let's hope that it works properly now. Now let's say create method. No. Okay, I'm not going to demo that. I hate this. Um, so, what is supposed to happen, imagine, was that it would actually have created the method and you basically continue to edit the method from there. And this is sort of standard operating procedure. Somehow it's still exemplar method group. That tells me we're still tied to the, to the, to the experimental module that, that uses exemplars. That's why it's not working. But why we didn't get rid of it, I do not know. But uh, I'll do this. Uh, no, I didn't want to do that. OK, well, I did that anyway. What I wanted was something entirely different. I want to get rid of this. Close anyway. I want to get rid of this. Uh, oh, I actually want, yeah, and then I want to do, let's see what happens now. So this is a workspace full of examples and stuff, right? So I can evaluate all this live and so forth, but we're not going to do that right now. We're going to try this one more time. Let's see actually what the settings are here on, uh, Okay, that's good. So we're not using the exemplar. So this is a new window, and I'm hoping it will actually. Oh, uh, no, that's not what I want. Well, that's good to have, but I want it to call binary search. give up. Uh, something's screwed up here. That's what happens when you don't prepare a demo in advance. Uh, right. But we have seen the debugger on the positive side. So what's interesting about the debugger is it's everything. In other words, you're not setting a, a checkpoint or a debug break. It's, it gives you a replay of everything, and then you can choose at any point. Well, so, so you are setting breaks, but you don't set them in the, well, it, this is in a case where it went bad and, and a signal got generated and it can open it and you can open it on any stack and manipulate because there is a, a reflective model of the process and the stack and everything which lets you do that. If you want to explicitly set a debug, what small, we do the same thing Smalldog does. Uh, we don't have breakpoints as such. You actually put in a halt call and say halt and it halts right there. Uh, so. There's lots of nice things about it. It's much nicer when it works uh, and much more compelling. So you'll have to agree with me. It just worked perfectly and you're all happy. Uh, but uh, generally, we, we, uh, we do have what's nice in general, right? We, we, we add things incrementally, right? So if we start with this method, right? We add this thing incrementally. And in principle, you can go call it now and it, by default, they return self. Since there's no interesting action in this method yet, so it actually worked and it returned. It just returned self, right, the, the object. And that's what it, so it's showing me, yes, this is workspace number so-and-so, right? But once I start putting code in it that, that's broken, you know, it might call and I'd get at this debugger and I should be able to edit it, right? So if I, if I start filling this the way it's supposed to work, uh, how do you do this? So, yeah, so low is like, woo, one, one based indexing. And this isn't the demo I want because that relies on the experimental stuff which has just succeeded in thoroughly breaking so I don't want to try and do that demo anymore. There's a video of it working on the net if anyone cares. Uh, but uh, let's see, right, so high would be uh, L size and uh, then mid would be you know, whatever it would be, it would be uh, high plus low over two, and that's not right, but that's the typical bug that people put in to demonstrate things. And, uh, you know, I can save it, and now I can 
run it again, and I still haven't done anything wrong, right? But at least I know these statements are working. Now I can actually go and I can put a halt in here instead. And what would typically happen if that thing had worked and I had asked it to put this miss missing method in, it would put in a body that was just halt. So the next time I run it, it'd halt and I could complete it, right? So if I run this and evaluate it, there it says halt. I go to the debugger. Here we are. We can step over the halt. Yeah, yeah. And I can change them here, right? So if I want them to be something different. So for example, I, uh, yeah, well, I have arguments here, but maybe I would like F to be found. So I can now say something like, uh, you know, A, B, F. And I can accept that. So I've actually, what the? okay, something's thoroughly broken in here and I'm not demoing this anymore because it's getting embarrassing. But uh, all, basically, all these things are we use day to day. Modeling objects. What has gone on? Okay, um, you know, clearly this is a, this was a bad. I should have, uh, you know, this was on short notice, and I've been at a conference, so I really am winging it. But yeah, it usually works. Uh, and yeah, this is, as I said, it's getting less stable rather than more a lot of the time, but we'll probably fix this in, in short order when, when I uh, find out what has gone wrong in this image. But uh, the basic idea is that you can tamper with it and change it and, uh, and you can change the code and then start, you know, start executing the method from that point without having to restart your process. And that's really what gives us its, its charm. You can change the code, you can change the definition of a class, and like in every small talk, all the instances in existence will be reshaped accordingly and all this kind of stuff, which means that you don't have, don't have to restart things from the middle, and that's what, one of the things that makes it really, really nice to work with. Uh, but that's, that's just any small talk does that. We do it with mirrors, which means that we have a story of how we could possibly make this secure, but it's essentially the, the reflective capabilities of a standard small talk. And what's unique is A, the modularity story is the, probably the most interesting thing, which leads to the security story and the access control story. And also interop, that we actually, we have better ways of calling out to see than most small talks and things like that. Uh, and that's kind of, the, the goal here was, when, when the project was funding, was to address weaknesses of classic small talks. And modularity and security and interoperability are, are basically the three high-level items that, that are problematic there. And so by having a module, since for example, this deploying to JavaScript, it's really hard to deploy in Smalltalk because this image model of a running heap that you can interact with is great in some ways, but also painful in others. So because there isn't source code for the whole thing, it's all objects, they're all intertwined. It's, it's kind of hard to extract your application out of one of these, of, out of this development environment. And, and therefore, the, you kind of have to carry the development environment typically with you, which means that if you deploy on a client, you know, everything's, it's very problematic in multiple ways. And so being, because we have a module system and we know exactly where things end and where they begin, it's really easy for us to, to do these deployment things unlike a regular small talk. That's, that's another advantage of the modularity thing. And it's at the root of solving the security thing, which I don't claim we have solved, but we have, we have a framework for doing it, right? You'd have to review all the libraries and, you know, da 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 da, -da to, to get to a secure system, and we'd probably have to run not on the squeak runtime at all to do that. But uh, at least we have the fundamentals there. Yeah? Uh, okay, so there's two things. There's, again, reality and idealism. Uh, so reality is Squeak has essentially a kind of green threads thing. This is what this debugger is talking to is basically, they, they call it process, and again, they were there first. Uh, and on an auto, I guess it really was a process in, in the sense that there was nothing else, but they're basically green threads. And processes can be handled reflectively, and you can ask them for their stack, and therefore you can implement a thing like this, and so forth. Uh, and that's what we're really using, you know, for the UI and the debugger and whatever at the moment in, in uh, here. The, we also have an actor system, which is rather immature, shall we say. 
but the, the, the story of Newspeak, again, consistency with the object model, the natural thing is to think of fine grade actors that essentially are, again, objects, but you communicate with asynchronous message sends to them. Right? So essentially, actor messaging, there's a syntax for, a, for, for, for sending things to a, to a remote object, like an actor, or objects within the actor. And, uh, and you can, you know, basically play pure, uh, purest actors, much like, say, Erlang or something like that. Except we could actually type check them, I suppose, to some extent, because in our model, it's not a, a pattern of a, of a struct that you're passing to something and then you're going to pattern match, as it is, say, in, in Erlang or in Scala. But it's actually considered a method call, just as an asynchronous method call. So we can find out potentially if this thing, you know, if it's declared as a variable, if it supports this kind of type and, and things like that. Because we just, we just like to cast it in, into the object model. So that's our story and it needs work because to, to make, to prove it, we'd like to get to a system where all of this was, was implemented. All concurrency, everything was really done through, the, through those actors of ours and not relying. We could still use the squeak stuff underneath to, to implement the actors, but to say share them across multiple threads and multiplex them. But we're not very far along on that. Yeah? Uh, if I'm um, a new, imagine a big project, I'm a newcomer to this project, and I get lost in the code, how mm. do I know what I'm playing with? It's a bit back to this type. Okay, so, so yeah, uh, well, Okay, so I, I view types and these kind of environments as alternate evolutionary paths that are trying to address similar problems and they address them in completely different ways. So, uh, you know, this environment gives you all kinds of navigation capabilities, right? There's a search bar, you can type in the name, you can, for a given method, you should be able to, uh, let's see if this shows that, okay, it's all broken. Uh, let's find something here in the history. Uh, okay, we don't have a history anymore because we got rid of everything, but let's go back to whatever it is, combinatorial. Right, so we navigate, if we know a name of something, we can find it. We can find, like, how many senders are for this method, and it'll give me a list of both implementers and senders, and I can, I sort of have a navigation model. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Well, right. What? Well, okay. So I'll tell you. Let me tell you about that experimental mode that, that doesn't work because that's part of the story here. So first of all, as in any dynamically, it's a formal parameter, right? You want to know the type is because you know it sounds like you're, that's what you're getting at that you would like to have a type on it, right? And I'd just like to know what. Okay, it's binary search e, uh, you know, foo comma, foo e bar l in Java. What, what do you know what l is? You know, all you know is that there's a type that claims it's a list, right? So, so the standard solution is this, you know, you know, the, 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 you know the type of the thing and, and that appears to satisfy people. So A, we have type annotations and I can write, right? We do have type annotations. Yes, we haven't checked them. It's not sound, da, 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 da. For documentation purposes, that works very well. We built this in StrongDog. Writing it down, whether it's actually validated to the last degree or not, it gives you most of what you need to know. You have some idea of what it is. That's, that's the zeroth order answer. The better answer is, I don't believe you should be looking at code divorced from, from actual data at all. So whenever you look at code, you should, be look, you should be able to actually evaluate pieces of it. You should be actually using it in a running context, which means I would like to know not just what someone said L is, that it's a list. I'd like to I'd actually have a list in hand that I can work with. I'd like to have bindings to actual values for every parameter and every, everything like that. And that experimental mode was, is basically about making it so that whenever you open one of these method browsers, it's actually like the stack frame in the debugger. It's tied to a bunch of values. And that raises all kinds of interesting questions like where the hell did I get the values from? 
But ideally, I would like to not be in a position to ever have to ask what L is. I'd like to be able not only to know what type L is, I'd like to know, give me an exemplar, give me an actual example of what L is going to be. And that's what we're shooting for. But as you can see, um, it's just a little bit flaky right now. So, this, what? I think it was flaky. That is flaky? I think I've shown that quite convincingly. <laughs> uh, but uh, if you actually, every time you look at code, whatever environment you're looking at, even if you were looking at it in a full you know, syntax of an editor, right? Any place you look to, you'd like to look at a variable. What thing is this? Right? It should all be alive. And it's an interesting question, okay, how do I figure out this stuff from the code, right? So there's, that's actually a research question. There's a bunch of things you can do, and they're kind of interesting. You could look at tests. Tests are a great source of data. You could, if you have types, you can then say, oh, it's a list. Well, I, I have a canonical list object I can figure out, and I can instantiate a list, and maybe it's the right kind of list, or maybe not, but I'll have a starter. I can... Uh, there are people doing interesting machine learning stuff where they can infer types from practically thin air. Just, uh, you know, basically by, by recognizing patterns of names and things in the code by machine learning compared to other things that are known, and they can actually tell you surprisingly well what, what things are, even without any annotations. Uh, you can do all kinds of inference algorithms, whatever you want, but the key thing is to can you figure out what, what, what good exemplar data might be. If this is a running system, there's a heap. I may have examples of, you know, I may have run this function before and I could, you know, track that and, and things like that. There's all kinds of interesting things you can do. That's, that's real research, right? I, I, no one's done anything that quite does this. But that's where I'd like this to go. Now, in practice, the Smalltalk community has been programming for 35 years without the benefit of either type annotations or this, and it's not a big deal. Right? But I'm not going to convince you of that unless you are already open to that because this is one of those religious arguments that goes on forever and ever and a little bit later than that. Right? But, uh, you know, if, if, if we could easily build a type checker for the annotations we had and optionally type check pieces and what have you, and maybe, maybe that answer is, is a bit more attractive to some people here. I don't know. But I, I'd like to see a lot more than that. Yeah? Okay, yeah. My question is, uh, I know the instance stores of data the class should be open to extending, right? Yeah. But is there a like, proper way how to make the class sort of final? No. So they can be extended? No. Not if, not if they're in the, not, uh, not if, you, if you have, if you can get the class, then you can subclass it and you can override any, any element, right? If you don't want that, Give them a different class, right? Create a class that wraps it, whatever you want. But no, there isn't. There aren't bells and whistles. There are no non-virtual methods. Non-virtual methods is a contradiction in terms. Otherwise, they're just subroutines. And uh, no, there are no mechanisms of that sort. Have you thought about uh, running the USP on JVM? Yeah, we've thought about uh, writing it on JVM. Yeah, uh, we have, uh, but uh, we don't. Uh, and so. Because it's hard. Um, so every now and then someone's expressed interest, but getting it to really work is hard because prime, well, okay, until a few, you know, this project has been around kind of as a, in the background for quite a while. When it started, the JVM didn't invoke dynamic, if you're familiar with that. With that, you can actually run a fair amount of things, right? Then, then you can, because the lookup semantics are different. You can't actually, you couldn't implement it efficiently before without that. You could write an interpreter, all kinds of things. But if you want to do it well, invoke dynamic, okay, so that now exists, and you could use that. What's still difficult is all this reflective change stuff that I wanted to show you that, that for some annoying reason isn't working right now, means that, you know, okay, tell me in the JVM how I am going to change a class. That if I want, really want to take advantage of the JVM's abilities and I want method calls to be method calls that the Java virtual machine executes through invoke dynamic and patching and whatever, but then I want to be able to change this and say, you know what, these instances now they need, I figured out that I need a new, a new uh, field for them. Uh, that's, the JVM does not facilitate that. You can come up with all kinds of really clever schemes 
but it's hard and it's and they're not very, you know it, it's it's a lot of work to make it work the JVM is not really well designed to support this sort of thing now if I had you know an army of, of people working on this sure it would be very nice to get it around the JVM but uh, you know we have to we we did it on Smalltalk to begin with because that platform makes it so easy to do this stuff. Because it, it has the right primitives to do it. So, have you endured enough? Or are there any other questions or what have you? Yeah. I'd like to ask you some uh, deployed application on, on JavaScript platform, some example application. Uh, if you go to, okay, so we do have a web browser, don't we? Uh, somewhere. Let's see. So what do we have here? So there's various things, right? So there's this this guy. Hello. So yeah, this is like a particle thing. This is not an image, right? This is a piece of JavaScript. This is a deployed JavaScript app. That is exactly our advantage over Smalltalk. We can deploy this independently of all the development environment and all these things. This is just an app, just like you wrote it in any retarded language. Yeah, and I yeah. want the source code and change it. Okay, so the source code is there in the, in the samples repository and GitHub, whatever, right? Uh, what else? Here's a nicer one, right? So here's mini browser. Right, so this is kind of a version of this environment, which is running, right, a, it, it evaluates, right, objects live, and you can browse them, and you, know, you can send something like self times 2, and that's 14, and you can do all kinds of stuff. You can find out what class it is, right, you can look at methods, you can do all kinds of things. Um, you can actually, I don't know if this version does, but we do have a version where you can change methods on the fly. Yeah, and uh, and uh, yeah, so I don't know, I, um, hopefully that answered the question. So there are some demos and, and the, the standard environment includes the ability to deploy to JavaScript. And none of this is as robust as I'd like it. I mean, usually it doesn't, it, it doesn't embarrass me in this way, but in general, you know, it is, you know, if you're a novice to this, yeah, there are rough edges. You have to be willing to put up with stuff simply because we, we don't have the quality control right now. Okay. Yeah. Do you find a garbage collection? Of course, there's garbage. I mean, uh, this is, we have garbage collection. I mean, how it's a garbage collected language. Now, we're running on run times, right? I mean, we have not had to implement that, right? Both the squeak runtime and the JavaScript runtime and the Dart runtime, whatever we've targeted, has a garbage collector, so it's not our problem. But yeah, it's, of course, um, I'm sorry that I, maybe I should have said that, but it, it seems to me totally obvious. We, or, yeah, that of course we it's a it's a high level language. We, we don't deal with with garbage uh, by you know. There's no funny reference guy. No, there's real garbage collection. So. You give up or? Come back to your slides. Yeah. Okay. Again. Yeah. So the slides about. Oh, we had slides once. Sign yeah. application on the clients and the server. So, so are are we uh, are we talking about just whether the code runs on client and server or what? 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 What are? Yeah. Well. Uh, I don't know what. Well, these, this is as far as we got with the slides, so I'm not sure what your, I mean, tell me when you see something that, so I'm, I'm not sure what you're referring to, but, uh, I've seen slides somewhere at the beginning, uh, I don't really, use the, as far as we the browser or the computing oh, okay. of the client. Okay, okay. So 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 this is this is kind of a separate talk. It was kind of background, but basically uh, if you wanted the idea is basically you'd like or I'd like at least you'd like to be able to keep all your all your application offline and yet 
to date all the time. The idea was that you know people syn synchronize objects for you know say a calendar or some application, right? The data you s there's a lot of apps that synchronize your data from some some cloud server. Essentially, programs are data, and I should be able to synchronize my programs using essentially the same mechanism. And so, if I imagine I had an, a, a, a store on a server of essentially objects, and it, you know, when I connected to it, it would be distributed like, a, like much like a distributed source control system, but except instead of dealing with text, it would deal with, with objects. You could actually implement it on top of Git and, and encode these objects as blobs of something or what have you. The main point is when you connect, you synchronize. So if you have, you have been in Kamchatka for three weeks and you come back and you know the app has been updated, you turn it on, it updates not only your data that you know someone updated your calendar, but it updates in the same go, it updates the code, right? And that can be done because we can, and we don't have to shut down your application. We basically have the ability to update code live on the fly and so we, we do this reflective stuff and we update the, the, the application. And all the data objects that you had update with it. So the new, if the new version of the application thinks that, that you know calendar entries look different, they'll get patched. That's kind of the essence of it. So this works? So when you no, it doesn't work. work. Okay. It, this, this was, oh, you know, it, 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 is, it is complicated, but believe me, most of what you're using every day is, is probably at least as complicated, right? It's just a question of whether, you know, it's, it's clean and, and well-conceived or, or just complicated. The, that story got us funding, but didn't get us permission to actually work on it. Uh, <laughs> it's a long story, but... So what did you do with the funds? <laughs> No, well, the funds were used to pay people to do build all this initial environment. So we could, we, we built the environment, we actually developed the language. Uh, but then people started, oh, can I have panels on the side in the UI? Does it work on Windows? So we did, they did write all kinds of interesting fundamental problems that, that needed to be solved first before you tackled this. Anyway, uh, we did some experiments, but we never really got there, I'm afraid. But, but, but the, the language was designed to make this easier for us. Basically, for start, if you make sure that there's no direct access to, to representation, that makes it a lot easier, right? Because everything is going through a procedural interface. So if I need to update things and I update my code, I can uh, arrange, for example, to update my, my code so that it has routines that will patch my objects lazily if, I, if they need to be patched. There's different ways I can do this. Basically, the indirection buys me a huge degree of flexibility that I never have to go and worry about how something is concretely represented ahead of time. Right? That means that objects are not allowed to have local state? No, that doesn't mean anything of the kind. It means that no one can reference it directly. It means that everyone who talks to it is talking through a procedural interface. That's, that's the point of, of, of all the stuff that I talked about, you know, uniform reference and such, is that even the code in the class itself isn't touching the representation directly. Then you can compile and optimize, but then these VMs have frameworks for de-optimizing and what have you. But in principle, anyone who's going to try, any code that ever is going to try and run and access this stuff will go through the indirection and gives you a nice place to trap and, and do all kinds of things, for example. That's one of the things that was helpful. And the fact that it generally is designed to support a secure reflective system so you can actually implement all this stuff and so forth. And it depends on your biases, and many people will tell me I'm crazy, and that's okay. They'll tell me that anyway. Uh, but that, that was the idea. And having a module system, having, being able to, you know, so languages that can do this, there are very few languages that would really do what Smalltalk does in, in this form, right? And so the ones that do generally don't have a module story and had a bad deployment story. And so bringing this all together with a concept of modularity, that is generally a useful thing. And the reflection and the security story all gave us a framework so it would be a lot easier to do, not easy, but easier or less hard, if you will, to do this kind of synchronization story. And unfortunately, um, yeah, no one wants to pay for this stuff, and it's kind of uh, a cool artifact. 
And, you know, there's all kinds of, the thing is, we run into problems with modularity every day that people jump through hoops and do dependency injection and they say they can't configure their imports this way or that way. None of these arise. This environment, basically, this, this scheme is really powerful with respect to modularity. You, you can configure things, you can mock things, you can, you can have multiple copies of different ones. It all works out of the box. In that respect, the, the design is, is it's dead simple. It's very consistent with respect to objects. And it can be done, well, it doesn't matter if your religion is imperative or not, because from the language perspective, uh, that syntax I showed you for initializing sl slots for fields, right? That is the only place where imperative state actually enters into the language. If I get rid of the, of the thing that declares a mutable field, there are no mutable fields anywhere. There's no mutable anything. You're basically in, in uh, applicative functional language. You need libraries probably have to be different, whatever, but nothing, you can no longer mutate anything. There's only one construct. It's very, a very small language, very localized. There's only one thing that makes it an imperative language. And having a functional dialect of this would also be a fun thing to do. But, you know, all of these things take time, and um, you know, there, isn't, there isn't enough time. Um, so you, you want to build an information system for multiple users. Mm -hmm. So there's some central database, and then multiple users want to update the data. Mm -hmm. So you still go with the overall architecture of, of a server application with some uh, data interface or HTTP and the client applications? I mean, you can go with whatever, arc I'm, I'm not and sure I... You have like a, a server application in running maybe the, the, the squeak? Well, I, I, yeah, so, so you can do, I mean, the squeak people do this sort of thing. Uh, I would prefer that what you view this as you have an actor that's remote and you have client actors, and they talk to each other through messages, and no one cares about HTTP or JSON or all this junk, right? Uh, you know, it's a web programming is just distributed programming through a horrible interface. Uh, and so, you know, the, the goal here would be to, you know, mature the actor model, making sure it works cross image, cross process, cross network, whatever. And sure, there's lots of engineering, but people have done p bits and pieces of this in all kinds of places, right? Bringing it all together takes resources, but basically the whole point of the abstraction is that you don't care about all these mechanics that, uh, that people spend so much time battling. But it doesn't really change the architecture of an application like that in any particular way beyond the fact that you don't have to deal with the plumbing as much. Uh, can I see an example? Probably somewhere in the test code, but uh, I wouldn't. Be, I'm not sure if you can see an example. Let's see what we can find. Because uh, as I said, it isn't something we really use. Let's see what we have under actors. Okay, well, apparently we have a namespace for them. Actor testing. That might be a good one. Uh, actor tests. So I have no idea. This is test code that I run wrote. So uh, I want to actually see the tests. Test factorial. So what is this doing? This should be as simple as it can be. Uh, right. So you give it basically, so math here is a class. Basically, you want to give it uh, an immutable thing to, to be its basis. So the, the, the code in the class, top level classes are immutable. Nested classes aren't strictly immutable because they can see this. If their enclosing class has state, they'll see it. But what you actually get is not the class, but the mixin. You just extract the code from it. And that is a, a pure value. And then you can create an actor from that, and it has code in it. And then that code basically means it, 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 you can create an instance of that, that that has instance messages. And when you send method messages to that actor, the corresponding methods will, will, will be triggered, right? So we create this thing, we get an actor that's basically running the math mixins code, and you send it the message new, which means it'll create a new instance. 
and that instance is a remote object that lives in, you have to know the kind of VAT model that, that say, E has. If you don't know that, that's one system. But essentially, an actor is an object, but more importantly, all the actors it creates, it, when, it, when it runs, it creates other objects, and some of them can be advertised as gateways, so you can talk to them directly, as they're called far references. So we start with a basic actor. It's running the class code to, for, for class math. You send it a message new. If there's a method new on, on the math class. It creates a new instance in that actor. And it returns me essentially a future here that is a, re a far reference to that. And then I keep talking to it. I mean, who knows when this will actually happen, but I've got a future right here, and I can keep talking to it. So this syntax is for the asynchronous, the remote message send. And so then I send this, this uh, instance of the math actor, I send it the factorial message. And uh, this assertion says that this should amount to that. And that's a, a, a very simple test, but it's a test of setting up an actor, creating an instance, and computing with it. And as I said, this thing is we're not really using it. It's very much a prototype, but that's the kind of model we, we have. Uh, so it basically lets you uh, create whole, either imperative or not, programs in a given actor from a value and have them talk to each other either by passing values or by passing references to essentially each of these, think of each of these objects that's as, as a port into the other op, uh, actor that you can, that actually you can send messages to. So you talk to them all as remote objects and they're all asynchronous and they get you futures back which you can keep talking to. And there's whole PhD thesis about these models, so I can point you at stuff where, where this comes from. And yeah, I can tell you don't believe it, but that's okay. It's, uh, it has to be proven that it really works well. Uh, some people have built systems around it, but maybe they're not you know, as mature. But anyway, uh, haven't I tortured you folks enough? <laughs> Discuss more uh, linguistic English. I'm sure everybody is invited, so thank you for your talk. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>